Welcome to this episode of the Brush and Soap and Blade Podcast, where we look forward to shaving every day. Welcome to episode 132 of the podcast. My name is Rick Dewey's, and I'll be your host this week. Okay, we start off this week with three emails all about people's experience with the carbon steel, feather, single edge, spineless blade. After we get through all that, and it's interesting because they all have similar experiences. After we get through that, we'll talk about Thursday's shave of the day. We'll talk about a blog post that uh, that I found over on Facebook, which was the uh, the Shave Like Granddad blog post. And uh, this is a blog that is uh, written by Doug. And uh, it's an update on, an, on the unrinsed brush experiment. How cool is that? Don't rinse your brushes. Yeah, it might work. And in fact, for, uh, for Doug, apparently it does. Anyhow, then we go on to the Friday shave of the day. I talk about what I did last weekend, which was go out to a camporee. Now, a camporee is where a district um, of scouts all get together, and you're talking 10 to 15 troops, um, all get together, camp out, and, uh, well, have fun together. So uh, talk about that a little bit. Sunday shave of the day, uh, followed by Tuesday's shave of the day, and... Uh, then uh, we go into revelations uh, that I found at the camporee. Ran into some experiences that, uh, well, just kind of, I don't know, surprised me a little bit. And uh, so we'll talk about that. Wednesday shave of the day. And then, uh, you know, I just need it to work. <laughs> Why can't it just work? <laughs> okay, so I went on a rant on something that, well, for the most part is uh, fairly simple, you would think. And, um, well, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Anyhow, the other thing that's uh, that's come to my attention is uh, Mr. Fine over there at uh, at uh, Fine uh, Accoutrements, uh, the guy that makes the uh, fine aftershaves, has now got into the razor business. He uh, went and built himself a super light slant razor, and uh, the reviews are starting to come in. There's a really, really good review over at Sharpologist, none other. Where else would you go to get your reviews on uh, shaving gear? Um, so uh, over there, the the Mister Fine Superlight Slant. It, it's done by uh, by Victor Marks, a really really good uh, post on uh, on all that is there to be known about the uh, the Mister Fine Superlight Slant. And uh, so I'll, I'll link to that. There's a video as well. I'll link to the. Uh, to that video, and in addition to that, I'll go ahead and link to the where you can find it over there at Fine Accoutrements. It's only thirty dollars for a uh, for a lightweight plastic uh, slant. Now I have not seen yet, but I'm sure it's out there. Somebody uh, testing this slant razor uh, up against the uh, the Mercure Bakelite uh, that uh, that I have, and uh, that would be interesting because they're uh, you know the Mercure Bakelite is a, a very very lightweight razor. And uh, so this one would be uh, something to kind of, I don't know, go up against it. And finally, just uh, I'll throw it in at the end of the show, in the show notes, I believe Barney Fife was, in fact, the originator of Common Core Math. <laughs> it's a quick YouTube video, and uh, it's well worth the look. Anyhow, that's the program this week. Let's get on with this thing. So after last week's episode, when I talked about the feather carbon steel single-edged spineless blade, I got an email from Keith. It says, hi, Rick. After last week's podcast about the carbon feather blade, I had to try them. Carbon blades always had a little bit of a keener edge in my experience going back many years in hand woodworking. Well, the blades came in Tuesday of this week, and I have two shaves so far. One was in an auto strop of V3, uh, VC3, and then a gem feather light with the aluminum spine hack attached. Right away, they both felt like used blades, or if the edge was gone, flattest angle I could get with the feather was still a scraping sensation. So, Wednesday night on the way to work, and 1.30 a.m. Central Time, I'm hitting the refresh key for this week's podcast on iTunes. I was hoping for an update you had with the Carbon Feather, and sure enough, you have a similar experience. 
One of your comments was about the grind angle. So when I got home from work this morning, I checked with a microscope the blade angle. Holding both the carbon and stainless side by side, they both look the same to me. The primary and secondary grinding marks look the same also. The only thing I could see was a slight candle reflection on the carbon blade that the stainless did not have. My conclusion is the honing process isn't carried out like the stainless blade. While I was in the shop, though, I honed the carbon blade edge on some 3M Micron lapping film I used to set the bevel of my straight razors until the candle reflection was gone. I have it ready for work tonight morning, and I'll see if there's any difference. I'll email you the results. Sorry for the long email, but I had to share after I heard that you were having similar results. I really appreciate the podcast and look forward to my Wednesday night drive to work. Regards, Keith. Well, Keith, thank you. That was something that uh, is definitely, you know, it may not be the grind angle. It may indeed be the fact that they're not completing the honing process, which, uh, yeah, which makes you wonder, what are they using these things for? Hmm. So I did get a follow-up email from Keith. It said, this is a follow-up on the Feather Carbon Blade. The blade worked much better after a quick hone, but obviously that's not practical. I'm wondering if these are an industrial blade used on machines and not meant to shave with and not taking the final honing process. I know of the standard spined single-edge blade available in bulk for scraping paint. Curious what the package says with the Japanese writing. Really hope the carbon blades would work, but I will stay with the stainless version for now, regards Keith. Yeah, um, I came to the same conclusion that it was quite obvious that there was something vastly different between the carbon blades and the stainless blades, the stainless being... Well, very much more comfortable and very much more usable and user friendly. Um, in other words, they don't, they don't scrape. They actually, well, shave. <laughs> Imagine that out of a blade for a razor. I also got an email from Randy about the carbon steel feather spineless. Thanks again for another great podcast. I was thinking about your experience with the carbon steel blade in the auto strop. I have a few auto strops and was thinking, since the blade is a carbon steel blade, have you thought of running it through the auto strop strop to better align the edge or possibly prep it for its initial shave? I have two of the auto strop strops, one being leather and one being a rubberized canvas, and have never used them since I always use the feather stainless blade that does not take any stropping. The carbon steel uh, may just possibly improve its performance by blade stropping. Rick, you may just want to put that in on your hypothesis test schedule. Again, thanks for your podcast. I always know when it's Thursday. I will keep an eye out for the blades when I go to the Big Shave West in Pasadena this weekend. That's uh, from Randy. Well, Randy, I have a problem with that. Um, great hypothesis. <laughs> I don't have a strop for any of my auto strops. You know, the interesting thing about the auto strop strop is that um, on eBay, for example, when you buy them or in antique stores or wherever, uh, typically they do not have the strops with them. Because quite honestly, if I look at the design, the unit is designed to actually have the blade running into the strop instead of away from the strop. You know, the the leading edge uh, actually looks like it's cutting toward the strop instead of being dragged behind as in a traditional straight razor. And because of that, um, strops get cut. Additionally, the strop material that they used for the auto strop strops was, well, exceedingly thin. (laughs) Just the way it was. And uh, if you look at the distance between the uh, two rollers for the auto strop, there's not a lot of distance in between those two guys. And so the strops themselves were very thin. And I don't have one. If I did, well, I probably would have tried it because, yeah, that was uh, 
kind of uh, what I was thinking about. You know, I have been looking, for example, on eBay for a long time for uh, one of the holders that they used to sell way back when with the razor kits themselves that uh, would hold the single-edged blade so you could, add, in fact, strop it on a regular straight razor strop and uh, get some more longevity out of the blades. I have been looking for one of those for probably a year. Now, granted, I haven't done it, you know, continuously, but I have been looking, and I haven't found one yet. Anyhow, I'll keep looking, and if I ever do run across a strop, yeah, I'll give it a shot. But uh, for right now, I don't have one. Oh, well. If you've got one, and if you run into some of those blades, um, give it a shot. Let me know how it works out. All righty. Well, <laughs> it's a nice day out this morning. Nice spring day. You know, it's interesting when you look at the trees. We've got a lot of oak trees and, and things in, in this area. And uh, the leaves, the young leaves, they're not, uh, they're not fully formed. They're like little baby leaves coming out. And it's just, it's just kind of cool. It, it definitely gives the idea that... Uh, you know, of a rebirth of, uh, of well, spring. So, anyhow, let's talk about the shave of the day. So, today I went ahead and soaked up my 1305 uh, brush. I hadn't picked out a soap for this week to play with. So, I went ahead and looked under the sink because I didn't have a whole lot of time. We have a typical on Thursdays, just kind of the way it is. Um, but uh, grabbed the first one that really caught my eye and... Uh, you know, I didn't have to dig in any boxes to get to, and that was uh, Eaton College, uh, Taylor of Old Bond Street. A lovely, lovely smell. So I went ahead and uh, soaked up a 1305 brush and uh, bloomed the Eaton College soap. Now, I have started blooming because one of the things that I'm doing with my, uh, with my bore brush is I will soak it. And then uh, when I get ready to use it, I'll squeeze the excess water out of it and then uh, pour the bloomed soap uh, water off of the soap and proceed to load. And I get a, a load of soap that is just really, really thick and rich, and I end up with much better uh, and much thicker lathers. So... Uh, I have been doing that, I guess now for about a month, and really, really enjoy it, and would uh, would suggest it highly. Um, it, it really seems to uh, to make a difference, and uh, so that's that's one of those little tidbits that I picked up somewhere, and uh, yeah, it works. So anyhow, after last week's uh, three blade smackdown and uh, smackdown palooza. <laughs> I decided that, uh, well, I, I needed to, you know, because quite honestly, there were there were times when I was using my, my razor and, and, you know, one of the blades was not performing well and uh, it just wasn't a, a close, comfortable shave. I mean, it was close but not comfortable or it was comfortable but not close, but, you know, it's just, yeah. So I decided, okay, I've got a brand new uh, feather stainless that I have here, and uh, my VC1 doesn't have anything in it. I'm going to go ahead and load up a VC1 and just kind of give my face a break and have a relaxing shave. Now, the other thing that's interesting is I was watching a, uh, a video, a YouTube video, that someone had linked to from one blade on how to shave with their razor. And I'm I'm sitting there watching this thing, and... Okay, the guy's doing a, a three-pass shave, or at least a two-pass shave anyhow, and going, uh, you know, with the grain in, in, I believe, all cases. And, uh, it, you know, the thing's got a pivoting head, and, and it was like, okay, so he's taking long strokes the first time and short kind of buffing strokes the second time. All right, fair enough. And I'm I'm sitting there thinking... That's not how I would probably use the thing. At which point, you know, I pick up the old VC1, uh, one of the old auto strops with the feather blade, and say, you know, I'm using the same blades as the one razor. And uh, it doesn't cost me. I, you know, I think my VC1, I think I paid 8 bucks for it. 
I think my VC two and four, I paid like fourteen or fifteen bucks a piece for them. You know, so you're not talking a whole lot of money, as you can probably tell. I'm a pretty big fan of auto drops just because they work so well. And uh, anyhow, I was sitting there doing a three pass shave. You know, one uh, one going with the grain first pass, then cross grain, and then against the grain, and end up with a a very nice, smooth, comfortable shave. Uh, just just shy of BBS. You know, if I'd done a little bit of buffing in a few areas, I would have gotten BBS without any problems. I had the lather for it, just didn't have the time. Just, you know, sometimes life gets in the way. But that's okay, because, uh, yeah, at least we started off with a good shave, and uh, we're just kind of looking forward to what life has in store. So I ran into this neat blog post over on uh, Facebook, Shave Like Grandad. And uh, he's got an update on the unrinsed brush experiment. And so uh, the, the pull quotes out of this thing are, For many months now, I've been shaving with an inexpensive badger brush and not rinsing it after each shave. In fact, I don't rinse it at all after the shave. I just... Hang it to dry as is. And the best part, uh, next one is, to this point, the experiment is a complete success. So despite dire warnings from at least one so-called expert, there is no discernible downside. Brush hasn't seemed to suffer. Would I recommend this no rinsing of the shave brush as Gillette did way back in the 1920s? I would. Hmm... That's rather interesting. I'll I'll put a link to the uh, to the blog post here and uh, let you read well the rest of the story. All righty, so let's talk about the shave of the day. Okay, first off, gorgeous day today. Holy cow! Just absolutely perfect. Nice weather, a clear blue sky, just absolutely gorgeous day today. And it started out with a really, really nice shave of the day. Okay, so I went ahead and I was running a little late. So uh, I went ahead and used the same soap that I had been using, which was the uh, Taylor Volt Bond Street Eaton College. Now, I'm, I must admit, I am, first off, I really, really like the Taylor Volt Bond Street soap. And I'm going to have to get some different flavors and different varieties, if you will, because uh, I just find it to be a very, very nice soap. So the uh, what I did, just to kind of switch it up a little bit, is I used a Treat King Super Stainless Steel Blade in a 1940s Super Speed Vintage Gillette. Um... And, you know, I, I got to admit, when I first put that blade in the razor, took the blade out of the package, I was like, okay, uh, I hope this doesn't go bad. <laughs> Only because I had been, I don't know, dealing last week with a blade that I was trying to like, and uh, it was kind of disappointing. And so I was hoping that this wasn't going to be a continuation of that or uh, anything of the sort. So lathered up a beautiful, absolutely beautiful, thick, luxurious lather. And uh, with just a touch of trepidation, put razor to face. And was surprised. Did it again. And was just a continual surprise state. Because with everything being said and done, this was not a bad shave. It was actually a pretty good shave. And I'm thinking, okay, a, a King Super Stainless Blade made by Treat probably isn't an exceedingly expensive blade, but the first shave of this thing is actually, well, pretty good. It's just, 
it, it really was rather amazing. It was, you know, blade probably only cost a quarter or so. I don't know. I haven't looked, but you know, you're not talking about top notch blade here. And uh, the feel, I mean, it was it was relatively smooth and gentle. And uh, the shave itself, now, this is a testament to the glide and cushion of the Taylor of Old Bond Street soap. Because after three passes, washed off, and there was some razor burn. There was some razor burn. But at the time that I did it, didn't feel a thing. Just really, really amazing, and uh, so walked out of the house with a uh, with a pretty good shave, a little bit better than socially acceptable, not quite BBS, but pretty, pretty close. And uh, yeah, threw on some um, some aftershave. Now the aftershave that I put on was Stetson with menthol in it. Doesn't have hardly any alcohol and mainly menthol, and so. Didn't get any uh, any sting due to the razor burn, and that's what I was after. I didn't really want any more sting and beating up my face and everything else. So, uh, you know, didn't do that. But all in all, a really, really good shave. Went down, got a cup of coffee, walked out into an absolutely gorgeous day, ready for just about anything that the day brought. And isn't that the best way to start? Well, we had an exciting weekend this weekend. We, uh, we went out camping with all the uh, Boy Scout troops in the district. And, uh, yeah, there were probably 200 to 250 boys and adults and... Uh, Went camping. I think there was, let's see, one, two, there's probably about nine or ten troops, maybe a little bit more. And uh, yeah, good time was had by all. And uh, I got to, uh, we, we did something, uh, that we had organized something that was similar to the Amazing Race, where you had to go to different countries and do things. And uh, so I was Japan. <laughs> and uh, I did one where they had the challenge for them was either uh, was to uh, build a camp gadget or do something else with lashings. And uh, so we talked about the lashings and then we went ahead and did it. And, you know, or actually they did it. And then we went ahead and talked about the lashings, make sure they understood the principles of the lashings. And, uh, yeah, it was a good time. But they did some orienteering. They did a, a rope maze. They, uh they did uh, trivia questions, first aid, I mean, just all the good scout stuff. Fire building, I mean, just, yeah, it was good, good stuff. Really enjoyed it. I think the, I think the guys liked it a lot. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a full day of activity, so, uh, so that was good. And, uh, yeah, so we got there Friday, set up, cooked a cobbler that night in a Dutch oven just to... Uh, have something to snack on, you know, nothing nothing like a sugar high before you go to bed. <laughs> it was a little cool, but uh, everybody uh, seemed to weather the storm well. Woke up the next morning, had a quick breakfast, got things organized, and, uh, you know, did the activities, had a, uh, had a good, uh, you know, pretty decent lunch. And then for dinner, we tried something. We tried Hawaiian chicken, but we tried Hawaiian chicken in aluminum foil on coals. And, uh, the <laughs> cook <laughs> did not pre-cook the rice and, uh, it was instant rice, but he didn't pre-cook it. And what ended up happening is any rice that was around a piece of pineapple wasn't too bad. Everything else, yeah, it was pretty crunchy, <laughs> but it was really good because the, uh, the, the rice that we had, uh, that was around the pineapple, it took out just enough liquid out of the pineapple to make them almost like uh, semi-dehydrated candy. Oh, it was good. <laughs> so, uh, you know, all in all, it was it was a good time. And, and, you know, realistically, it's things like that. Yeah, it didn't work well, but so? It was edible. Nobody died. You know, it's just, oh gosh, the kids started complaining and everything. Whoa, 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 time out. Did you cook it? <laughs> No, well, shush. <laughs> Jeez, but uh, oh well. 
We were giving the guy a hard time, too, because he was working on his cooking merit badge. So uh, <laughs> it was rife with opportunity for, well, fun. <laughs> Anyhow, had a good time. Had the bugle out and waking kids up with bugle calls. And, oh, yeah, they just they, they loved it. <laughs> Anyhow, we got out of there at about noon on Sunday. And uh, after a pretty good breakfast and uh, came on back to the house and whew, recovered. <laughs> Full day of activity out in the sun and, you know, doing stuff and trying to stay on, uh, you know, pay attention, make sure no one gets hurt and all this other stuff. And we didn't have any problems with us, but, uh, you know, you always, you know, even if you, if you know about your own kids, for example, you know, you're always a little cautious about little Johnny coming over, you know, the next door neighbor. It's like, eh, I'm not so sure about him. <laughs> One of those kind of things. So, uh, anyhow. Good time was had by all. So, in fact, the next day it was interesting. Uh, one of the, I was shaving with the bomb on the back of the truck, actually while listening to uh, to Mike Rose, uh, the way I heard it, which is a new podcast which I really really enjoy. It's. Uh, it's for those of us with short attention spans. But I found, now, Mike Rowe, if you don't know, Mike Rowe's an Eagle Scout. And uh, very supportive of the scouting movement, as you can imagine. And uh, so all my boys know, or most of them know, who Mike Rowe is. And so to hear him talk about the way I heard it of different things, uh, you know, how James Earl Jones got his start and the, uh, the start of... Uh, Oh, I don't know, all kinds of stuff. But anyhow, we had that on a Bluetooth speaker up on the truck while we were cleaning up and breaking camp. And, uh, you know, when they get done, they just actually just sit in their chairs and just listen to that. And just, just, I mean, they were enthralled and uh, really good to watch and uh, listen to. And uh, good to see them listening to something that is entertaining, educational, and, uh, well, at the same time, kind of fun. Yeah, I... Yeah, the other thing that we do, just uh, as a point of reference, is that our evening tradition is to break out the uh, the old time detective stories like Dragnet, and Johnny Dollar, and you know the uh, those kind of things, and listen to those. And uh, they they really have a good time doing that. And it's it's one of those things where after dinner it's kind of relaxing, and then you know. Then I turn that off and go do my stuff, and uh, they go and play their. They've got a game that they, a couple of games that they play, and uh, you know, just around the campfire type things, and uh, everybody has a good time. But they do enjoy the old time detective radio shows, and it's interesting to see them, uh, you know, talk about them and listen, and, and actually shush each other when somebody's making too much noise and they can't hear. <laughs> It's uh, it's really, really a lot of fun. Anyhow, so I was uh, we were listening to uh, to a podcast, and I was shaving on the uh, on the back of the truck there after I'd put my tent up, and uh, one of the boys came up. He said, "I want to see how you do that." And I started telling him a little bit about it, and he said, "So is that a double edged blade?" I said, "Yeah, it's you know I was using my super speed," and he said, "I said yeah, it's a double edged razor." He said, well, where, where's the, uh, you know, where's the blade? So I twisted the silo doors open and pulled the blade out. I said, there's the edges right there and dropped it back in. He said, oh, I get it. Talk, talk to him a little bit about lather and, you know, the fact that you, you know, if you're going to go over a, a, a pass over, you know, uh, or a second pass or another stroke or something, you need to make sure you got lather on down there so that you don't have irritation and scraping and things like that. You know, we talked we talked the day earlier about, you know, the stuff in the in goo in a can that may not be really, really good for skin, especially for a teenager's skin. Maybe the reason that teenagers break out when they start shaving as well. And uh, amongst other things, but uh you know, they may be shaving too close, they may be, you know, using a cartridge razor and actually getting some hysteresis and getting some ingrown hairs and, you know, all of that stuff. Uh so it was a good conversation, but it was uh, it was just you know another opportunity for you know a, a guy to see you know someone shaving and walk up and say okay how are you doing it what are you doing why are you doing it this way what's the principle you know all that stuff you know the stuff that we've missed the stuff that we we get to the point where for some reason somehow it's become this this dark secret thing instead of a rite of passage it's uh, 
yeah. Anyhow, it was a good time, and like I said, wet shaving was well represented. All right, let's talk about the shave of the day. Okay, so I find that uh, if I have a camping trip over the weekend, it really throws my soap selection game off its tracks. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it takes me longer to recover anymore from uh, a weekend of uh, uh, fun <laughs> or what it is, but... I just find that my my soap choices are I don't know they just kind of fall back to knowns and it's not very uh thought out and well it's just the way it is I suppose anyhow so today's soap it was the same as yesterday's which was uh Phoenix Artisan Ecutrements and uh it was the lavender and cedar now as I said a while ago, um, I have started, after I soak my brush, squeezing the excess water out of it and blooming the soap. And the combination of the two gets me, well, just marvelous loads very quickly, loads of soap in the brush, and uh, then produces just exquisite lathers. And the uh, the lavender and cedar... Uh, PAA was, uh, was no exception. Excellent, excellent lather. Beautiful, thick, rich. I mean, just, yeah, way to go. So, uh, did that. I am still using, and I am, to be quite honest, rather surprised it has lasted this long. Um, I am still using my King Blade by Treat. And, uh, it's not a bad shave. Three pass. Um, with a little bit of touch-up and, you know, pretty much BBS on the cheeks, uh, around the chin, under the chin, we'll call it socially acceptable. So the blade is starting to go. It is starting to wear out. The thing is, is that because I am getting such good lathers of quality soap, um, I, it's not an uncomfortable shave. I don't notice nicks and cuts and razor burn or anything like that. It's a it's a very smooth shave all the way down. Uh, it's just that it doesn't have the same level of cutting performance that it did when it was new, and so that's that's a good way for a for a blade to uh, to slowly uh, fall off the edge, if you will, uh, because you know you don't have to suffer. Uh, so that's a, that's a good thing. And quite honestly, if I'd have spent more time, felt around a little bit more, done a few more touch-ups or whatever, I could have gotten BBS. It probably would have taken a little bit more time in the touch-up department, but all in all, not too shabby. Um, however, I think that it's probably, let's see, I've got uh, Thursday, Friday, Sunday, uh, yesterday and then today. So what is that? Five, six days, something like that. Uh, five days anyhow. Yeah, five days. Anyhow, that's probably about the limits of this blade. I mean, I could stretch it to tomorrow, but, uh, don't know that I will. Uh, just one of those things that, uh, I don't know. Again, you could. It's kind of like, uh, you know, the article that I read about the Gillette, you know, Gillette Shave Club uh, the other week. You know, you could probably stretch one of their blades, one of their cartridges to, uh, you know, a week or a month or whatever the heck it was. Yeah, you can, but why? <laughs> when you're talking about a razor that is, or a shaver or a blade that is so, well, inexpensive, why would you bother stretching it out? Just uh, take it to its useful life and call it a day, start over again. Yeah, now, that's the nice thing about shaving uh, with traditional razors, single-edged and double-edged. The blades really are not that expensive. You know, and if I can get three days out of a blade, three or four days out of a blade that only costs a quarter, I'm still head and shoulders, head and shoulders above, 
what I can do financially with a cartridge. Anyhow, that was uh, that was the shave of the day. Didn't finish off with uh, with any kind of uh, aftershave because I didn't do it yesterday either. And one of the things that I noticed yesterday was that pretty much all day long I was getting whiffs, whiffs and wafts and just you know just little itty bitty you know scents here and there of lavender and cedar from the uh, from the soap. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. I mean, didn't happen all the time, but just every now and then, you know, which was really really nice. Do enjoy the smell, and uh, yeah, a good shave of the day. It's a beautiful day. Let's go get to it. So speaking of camping. While I was out there being uh, the the Japanese Border Patrol agent uh, for the amazing uh, race uh, scout competition um, for Japan, we uh, I went ahead and made sure that wet shaving was in fact represented. Yeah, I represented well. I had the bomb out there, and uh, so I had some uh, some Cold River Soapworks uh, shaving soap cedar wood just because I knew that it would be a popular scent. Had my fine shaving brush uh, just because uh, it was in the case and I don't have to worry about packing it up wet or uh, any issues like that. It's pretty, don't have to soak it, pretty much good to go pretty quickly, so that was good. I had a gold dollar straight razor. Yeah, yeah, I know, gold dollars get a lot of grief. I get that, but at the same time, if I'm going to take a razor out camping that may get damaged, that may get dropped, that may get beat up, I do not want it to be one of my nicer straight razors. I'm okay sacrificing a gold dollar. So just like everything else, I mean, certain times, certain things fit and fit well. And in this case, the gold dollar did. So I took my, uh, my portable mirror and attached it to my flagpole, which happened to... Uh, have the Japanese flag up on it because I was Japan after all at this particular challenge. And while I was waiting for troops to either uh, get done or come in or whatever, I proceeded to give myself a three-pass straight razor shave. Now, the other thing that was highly, highly interesting while I was standing there giving a stri- you know, doing a straight razor shave, first off, um, you got to make your lathers just a little bit wetter if you're in a breeze, because they will dry out quickly. That was uh, a lesson that uh, that was brought to my attention, uh, like within the first stroke. <laughs> so uh, anyhow, it was uh, it was not a bad thing, easy to fix, but something to consider if you're outside. You may need to make your lathers well just a little bit wetter. So take straight razor to shave. Do a do a, a pass. You know, dry off, get another troop going, you know, answer some questions, do whatever. But what amazed me, absolutely amazed me, is the number of adult scout leaders who came up and said, I've never seen anybody use a straight razor. I've never seen that done. What are you doing? And, uh, yeah. Yeah. It started a lot of conversation, conversation about the, uh, the benefits of the soap and brush versus the goo in a can, the moisturizing characteristics, the fact that the, the, the lather that you're whipping up with a brush actually contains moisture, whereas the lather in the goo in a can really doesn't. And uh, the, the fact that the moisture helps soften the beard so that it cuts easier and you get a better and more comfortable shave. The fact that you can, you know, buy a straight razor for, okay, in this case, and yeah, there's going to be some people yelling at me right now, but the fact that you can buy a straight razor for about two and a half months or two months worth of cartridge blades, and if you get a set of stones and learn how to strop and everything else, you can make that razor last you darn near a lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. It was really, really good conversations and very, very eye-opening. They all enjoyed the, uh, the, the, uh, cedar smells of the Cold River Soapworks soap 
uh, they thought that that was much, much better than uh, than the goo in a can sense. Perhaps Barbasol being, uh, you know, the one exception, the barbershop scent of Barbasol being, uh, you know, oh, well, they're, you know, I like that. Okay. I should have brought some uh, some of my, you know, barbershop scents and uh, my cease and desist, for example, and whipped up a lather of that just for them to uh, witness and see. But uh, it was all really, really good, really re- interesting. I also had with me my 1940s uh, uh, Gillette Super Speed with the King Blade in it, made by Treat, that I've been uh, testing out this week. And one guy pointed at that. He picked it up. He said, what's this? I said, well, that right there is a 1940s uh, vintage Gillette Super Speed uh, twist-to-open double-edged razor. And he said, "Wow, that's pretty cool." Another guy said, "Yeah, I learned how to I learned how to shave on one of those things. Those things will lay you open." And I'm thinking to myself, "Not if you use them right. <laughs> if you use them right, it's no. You can lay yourself open with a straight razor. Now that's for sure. But uh, a double edged? Nah." <laughs> Wonder if his dad had a had an old fat boy cranked up to like a nine. <laughs> Makes you wonder. All right, let's talk about the shave of the day. Okay, so the shave of the day. Jeez, <clears throat> uh, the pollen count is high, and. Uh, <laughs> One of the problems was sleeping the wind with the windows open. I enjoy sleeping with the windows open, but when the pollen count is high, it can be a little rough on the throat. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> okay, so the shave of the day. I had decided after yesterday's shave that the King Blade by Treat was, well, post. <laughs> I decided that, uh, yeah, it was on its last legs, and I wasn't going to force it. I was just going to stop because, well, I could. I have more blades than I know what to do with, and so, you know, taking one and stretching it to its absolute utmost limits is not necessary. Um, And so at that point, I said, well, okay, what do I do now? Well, the other day when I went camping, I pulled out one of my old uh, uh, DOP kits, uh, that I had. I've got about two or three of them that are packed up and uh, ready to go, if you will. And uh, inside the, the one that I used the last time I traveled anywhere was a Schick Injector G model. Um, and so I went ahead and picked that up. It was sitting by the side of the sink, picked it up, put a fresh Schick blade in it, and used that. Now, of course, before I used that, I soaked up my 1305 brush and actually rummaged around under the sink and pulled out some tiki soap, some uh, Into the Forest tiki soap, bloomed it, and again, amazing difference when I bloom, uh, mainly in loading. So, yeah, good stuff. So I went ahead and bloomed it, uh, let it sit, jumped in the shower, and uh, after uh, after the shower, jumped out, squeezed the uh, the excess water out of the uh, the 1305, which has not popped its top yet, so that's good. Apparently, I used enough glue this time. <laughs> it has done a great job, and I am happy to report that it is back in action. So, uh, yeah, good stuff. Anyhow, um, went ahead and uh, poured off the bloom water and proceeded to load up the brush and got a phenomenal amount of lather out of that load of the tiki soap. And, uh, yeah, really enjoyed it. Lathered the face three passes later, and I was kind of feeling around after rinsing off and realizing that if I did any touch-up at all, it would be exceedingly slight. Uh, exceedingly marginal touch-up, and I had achieved just pretty much effortlessly a BBS shave. And again, you know, it's one of those things where I just sit there in absolute amazement and wonder how a BBS shave comes to pass so easily and so effortlessly, and yet at the same time, these razors are not de rigueur, 
and uh, not standard everywhere. You know, it's, it's like, how did we get away from this stuff? These things worked great. And uh, yet, apparently, the patents run out, and they're no longer patentable. And so companies, in their infinite wisdom, must go ahead and get out of the business because, well, you can't make any money on a non-patented item. So let's go with something, well, new and improved. <laughs> uh, at least that's my theory. That's the only reason that I could think of that somebody would take a razor that functions so well and uh, get away from it. It's just, it is amazing. Anyhow, um, like I said, BBS shave, threw on some Clubman afterwards, uh, just, you know, now, the one thing that I noticed in the in the Clubman, there was just a bit of stinging, okay? Don't know if it was uh, razor burn or what, but it was slight but consistent everywhere that, 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 you know, I shaved. So it was either a reaction to something in the soap or it was the razor. I don't know which. So uh, maybe tomorrow I'll... Uh, stick with the injector and uh, try something else out and, uh, well, just see. Anyhow, that was the shave of the day. Can they not make a standard-sized coffee cup holder in an automobile in any type of vehicle, whether it's a truck, car, or whatever. Can they not make a standard size? And then if they do, in fact, have a standard size, which I'm not 100% sure of, but if they do, can they not make a standard size travel mug? Okay, so the story behind this one is I was driving to work yesterday, and I had been... Uh, I. I was using a stainless steel mug, an insulated stainless steel mug, for my coffee. And it was filled up probably three-quarters of the way. And I went ahead and put it in my coffee holder, and off to the races we go. And the first time that I had to apply foot to brake, the coffee cup wobbled, and the coffee proceeded to splash out of the coffee cup. Now, the thing that's really irritating about that is that I have some coffee cups that do that and some coffee cups that just sit there like they're part of the vehicle and do not move. Now, the coffee may slosh around in them, but because of the fact that they do not move, coffee doesn't have enough momentum to actually get up over the edge. So I'm sitting there thinking to myself, okay, self, what the heck is going on here? And then I got to ask myself, okay, is it is it because people are making different odd-sized coffee mugs? Or is it because there is no standard in the automobile industry of what size a coffee mug holder should actually be? <sighs> you, you know, you'd think that there was something, even if, okay, for example, you would think that, that Ford, I'll just pick a name, would go ahead and at least within their automobiles, Make a coffee cup holder that is the same size all the time, year after year after year after year. And then, if they had any marketing sense at all, they would license with somebody to utilize their shape. To the point where you had a coffee mug that was actually fitted to your mug holder. So that it wouldn't slosh around, so that it wouldn't splash, so that it wouldn't make a mess. And you would think that someone who would license something like that would license it with somebody who would make a plethora of different designs, of different styles, all fitting the same base. So that you would have a coffee mug that could be personalized and different and, you know, all that, but always fit your car. Ugh, it's not that hard. Oh my gosh. And and yet people keep making coffee mugs. And I, unfortunately, I keep buying them because I think they look nice or somebody gives them to me and I decide, well, somebody gave it to me. I ought to use it, I suppose. And lo and behold, it doesn't work. <laughs> 
it sloshes coffee around. And it came real close to splashing coffee around on top of the control panel inside the mobile studio. Hence the ramp. <laughs> oh, jeez. Uh, it is amazing. There are so many opportunities out there. And the problem is, is that every time there's an opportunity, someone comes along and messes it up. Because the first time that somebody would come along and say, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's standardize all coffee mugs or this type of coffee mug will fit this kind of vehicle forever and ever, guaranteed not to splash, not to make a mess. And then, of course, the auto company will change the size, style, or fit of their holder. <laughs> It happens every time because it's new and improved. You know, you can't go with something that works. You can't go with something that's good because, oh, my gosh, somebody might copy it. Okay, so if somebody might copy it, maybe it's because your prices are too high. Uh, you know, I mean, I understand making a profit, but at some point you got to come down and go, all right, right, let's. Uh, we'll continue to make this because it sells. And we can make a little bit of profit off of it. But we're going to set the profit level right here so that it pays for itself. We'll have a lot of people employed. And if anybody copies it, they're going to basically be taking it in the shorts because they can't, uh, they can't afford to copy it. I don't know. Maybe I'm naive. I understand that businesses try to make huge profits as fast as possible. Okay, I get that. But at some point, you would think, that just for longevity, since you have the equipment anyhow, that you could just sit there and continue to make things. Now, granted, there are some wear components and everything else, but the cost of replacing those ought to be factored in to the uh, to the product cost, I would think. I mean, my gosh, people, we've got computers. We ought to be able to figure this out. <laughs> anyhow, apparently the one thing that we can't figure out is how to make a coffee cup it doesn't slosh coffee all over the place in the morning while you're driving to work, half tired and asleep, looking out for the other people that are half tired and asleep out here on the highways and byways of the of the country. Uh, just one of those things. Well, that concludes this episode of the Brush and Soap and Blade podcast. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed making it. If you have some suggestions or would like a topic covered, drop me an email at brushandsoapandblade at gmail.com or give me a call at 864-372-6234 or contact us on Twitter at Brush and Blade. You can also visit us at our blog, brushandsoapandblade.wordpress.com. As always, we're available on iTunes and Stitcher. <laughs>